In December 1976, the Los Angeles Police Department received a call that a dead body had been found at a funhouse ride at a local amusement park called The Pike. When the police arrived, they found a mummified corpse covered in paint with a noose around its neck. The corpse had been discovered by a member of the production crew during the shooting of an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man. The crew member had broken off one of the arms while removing the corpse from a gallows during the shoot. Looking inside the arm, he saw what looked like human bones. The mystery mummy was taken into care by the Los Angeles coroner for further examination, where it was hoped the identity of the body could be discovered. The body was in terrible shape, even for a corpse. The mummy was missing its ears, as well as some fingers and toes. Upon further examination, the body showed signs of a previously performed autopsy. Inside the chest cavity, the coroner found a gas check, which was an important component in some bullets used during the first part of the 20th century. Tests of the mummy's tissue revealed extraordinarily high levels of arsenic, which was an important chemical used in the embalming process up until the 1930s. Surprisingly, a few ticket stubs from a 1920s traveling sideshow and a penny from the same decade were found inside the mummy's mouth. Based on the clues from the bullet component, the arsenic, and the tickets, the coroner could estimate that the man had been shot and killed sometime between 1905 and 1920, but it seemed unlikely that they would be able to determine just who this man was. Nearly 100 years before, in 1880, Sadie McCurdy gave birth to a son at the age of just 17. She named him Elmer. Sadie was unmarried and the identity of the father was unknown. In order to protect young Sadie from the shame that came with single motherhood, Elmer was given to her brother and sister-in-law, George and Helen, to be raised as one of their own. Things for Elmer began to unravel in 1890, when George died of tuberculosis and Elmer moved from Washington, Maine to Bangor, Maine, with Sadie and Helen. It was at some point in Elmer's young life that Sadie revealed that she, not Helen, was his real mother. This news was presumably distressing to young Elmer, and he became rather rebellious. He took to drinking during his teenage years and became a very heavy drinker, a problem that would haunt him the rest of his life. What was that you called us? Now look. By 1900, Elmer was a trained plumber, but tragically lost both his mother and his grandfather in that same year. After losing his reasons to stay in Maine, he began drifting, working odd jobs as a plumber and miner, ending up in rough towns in Kansas and Missouri. He struggled to keep regular work due to his penchant for alcohol. In 1907, Elmer joined the United States Army, where he was trained as a machine gunner, as well as in demolition using nitroglycerin. In November 1910, he left the Army at the age of 30 with an honorable discharge, but was arrested only 12 days later with an old Army buddy for possession of burglary paraphernalia, which included chisels, saws, gunpowder, and nitroglycerin. Elmer and his partner pleaded not guilty and said that the tools were instead meant for a new machine gun they were inventing. Elmer and his buddy were found not guilty and released from jail in January 1911, and so began the most eventful year in Elmer's life. Upon his release, McCurdy became a full-time criminal. McCurdy, along with a couple other men, formed a gang where they specialized in safe cracking, with McCurdy serving as chief safe cracker, owing to his experience with explosives. However, McCurdy's skills in cracking safes and robbery were proven to be overestimated when on March 30, 1911, they robbed a train belonging to the Iron Mountain Missouri Pacific Railroad near Lenapa, Oklahoma. The safe on the train contained $4,000, which McCurdy blew to pieces, along with the rail car it was in. The blast was so intense that some of the silver coins in the safe fused to the walls, and in the end, the McCurdy gang only managed to get away with $450. In September 1911, the McCurdy gang targeted the Citizens Bank in Chautauqua, Kansas. The safe they were after lay in a vault protected with a heavy door. McCurdy blew up the vault door with nitroglycerin, which also had the effect of destroying the bank interior, but the safe itself remained intact. McCurdy charged the safe door with nitroglycerin, but it didn't detonate. By this time, the bank robbery was hours in the making, and the lookout man took off out of fear of being caught. 
Without their lookout man, McCurdy and the others grabbed what they could from the bank vault and ran. Their time and effort only yielded them $150. After the citizen's bank job, McCurdy lay low in Oklahoma for a few weeks, where he drank and waited for his next job. It was botched robberies like these that earned McCurdy a reputation as being a bumbling outlaw. Only a few weeks after their misadventure in Kansas, the McCurdy gang heard about a train with a large amount of money destined for the Osage tribe. On October 4th, 1911, McCurdy and his gang stopped and searched their targeted train. They furiously searched the cars looking for the safe while terrifying the passengers, but soon realized that they had robbed the wrong train. Not wanting to leave empty-handed, the gang took $46, a watch from the train conductor, a revolver, and some large jugs of whiskey. The gang immediately split up, and McCurdy returned to his hideout in Oklahoma, where he began to drink his way through the stolen whiskey. A local newspaper proclaimed the holdup, quote, the smallest in the history of train robbery. McCurdy was accused of the robbery, and a $2,000 reward was issued for his capture. Three days later, on October 7th, a sheriff's posse attracted McCurdy to the ranch of Charlie Rivard in Oklahoma, where he had spent his time drinking and sleeping in a hay shed. The posse surrounded the hay shed and shouted for McCurdy to surrender, but McCurdy refused and opened fire on the posse. The shootout lasted an hour and ended when McCurdy was shot in the chest and died. Sheriff Bob Fenton, who was involved in the shootout, reported on October 8th that so many shots were fired that it was unclear who fired the shot that killed McCurdy. McCurdy's body was taken to nearby Pahuska, Oklahoma, where it underwent an autopsy and was embalmed by Joseph Johnson. Worried that it might be a while before McCurdy's body would be claimed by relations, Johnson used an inordinately large amount of arsenic to embalm the body. Weeks went by and nobody came to claim McCurdy's body. Not wanting to go unpaid for his services, Johnson brought McCurdy's body out to serve as a sort of advertisement for his funeral home. McCurdy's body was redressed in street clothes and propped up in the corner of the parlor with a rifle laid across his hands. Johnson charged a nickel for people to come and see what Johnson had named the Oklahoma Outlaw. McCurdy's body became so popular, Johnson received offers to sell McCurdy, but by now, McCurdy was earning more in death than he had in life, and Johnson refused to sell. In 1916, two men claiming to be the brothers of the deceased arrived in town seeking to claim the body. After some legal cunning, Johnson reluctantly gave up McCurdy's body to the two men who promptly disappeared. The brothers turned out to be James and Charles Patterson, who owned a traveling carnival from Texas. McCurdy became part of their traveling show until 1922, when he was sold to Lewis Sonny, who owned a traveling show of his own called the Museum of Crime. McCurdy's body traveled with the Museum of Crime, where it was featured alongside wax figures of more well-known criminals such as Jesse James and Bill Doolin. Sonny leased McCurdy's corpse to a filmmaker in 1933, he used the body to advertise his film, Narcotic. McCurdy's body was displayed in theater lobbies and described as the corpse of a druggie who committed crimes to feed his drug habit. McCurdy rejoined the Museum of Crime and toured until Sonny died in 1949, and the Museum of Crime came to an end. After touring the country for over 20 years, McCurdy's body was placed in a Los Angeles warehouse where it remained until 1964, when McCurdy was loaned to a filmmaker David Friedman, who used McCurdy in his 1967 exploitation film, She Freak. Just a year later, McCurdy began life on tour again, when he was sold to Canadian businessman Spoonie Singh, along with some of the old wax figures from the Museum of Crime. When he finally returned to California, he was deemed too gruesome and not lifelike enough to be exhibited further. Rather than put the corpse to rest, he was sold yet again to Ed Leersch, who was the owner of the Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. McCurdy's new owners thought he was nothing more than a funhouse fake and stuck him in the Laugh in the Dark Funhouse, where he was painted with day-glow paint and hung from a gallows as a cheap scare. After the 1976 autopsy, investigators used the Museum of Crime tickets to track down Louis Sonny's son, Dan Sonny, who told them who the body was. McCurdy's identity was further confirmed by forensic anthropology tests. But the question remained, 
What was the L.A. coroner to do with the mummified corpse of an Oklahoma outlaw? On April 22, 1977, Elmer McCurdy finally received a funeral in Guthrie, Oklahoma, 66 years after his death. Elmer's coffin was taken to the cemetery in a glass-sided hearse pulled by two white horses. The hearse driver, as well as the funerary procession, wore period clothing. McCurdy was buried in Boot Hill Cemetery in Guthrie, Oklahoma, next to other notable Oklahoma outlaws. His coffin was covered in concrete to ensure that McCurdy would finally be laid to rest. <laughs>